In chapter three, we're going to start talking about scatter plots. Um, we're going to talk about some correlation. We're going to talk about uh, association. We're going to talk about least squares, regression lines, uh, things of that nature. So things that you probably have possibly seen a little bit before. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say scatter plot? Some of you a little bit. When I say like a linear regression or least squares line, you guys remember seeing those at all? It's like if you have a scatter plot listed out, trying to find the line of best fit. Okay, that's going to be kind of what we're dealing with in this particular chapter. All right. So today we're just going to kind of go through an introduction and talk about scatter plots in general. So how do we describe scatter plots? How do we create them? Uh, things of that nature. So the first thing, the reason scatter plots are important, they're uh, the topics we're going to be discussing later on. Statistics is often not about studying one variable. So in chapters one and two, everything we did only dealt with one variable. How does this one variable distribute across um, given values? But in statistics, a lot of times the more interesting problems are the ones where we start comparing variables and how they relate to one another. So how do variables interact with each other? For instance, you can study things like the number of algebra classes a kid takes and their score in ACT. They found that in general, students who take more algebra, take more math, score better on the ACT test. Okay? So basically what we're doing here is we're taking variables and we're trying to compare them, see if there are any patterns or trends that appear between the two, how they relate to one another. Now an important aspect of this, something to kind of keep in mind, when we talk about relationships, when we say there's an association between two variables, these are tendencies. They are not rules. Okay? So when we say people who take more algebra classes tend to score better on the ACT, that does not mean that there aren't some kids out there that don't take that many algebra classes but still do well. Or there might be a kid that's taken every single math class they could possibly take and still don't score well in the ACT. Okay, so they're patterns, they're trends, they're not necessarily rules. It's not saying if this goes up, this is definitely going to go as well. Okay, so always keep that in mind as we kind of discuss our topics with scatter plots and other items here. So within a study, so basically what we're going to be looking at are studies. What variables are they measuring? How do those variables relate? Is there some sort of association or not? Things of that nature. So there are two different types of variables you're going to be studying when you're working with these types of problems. The first one is called the response variable. Now the response variable <laughs> is the variable that's kind of the measure of the outcome of the study. Or it's the de dependent variable. So we have two variables that we happen to be looking at. One, we're going to think may cause a change, may have a reason to change the other variable. And then we have the response variable, the one that will de be doing the changing, the one we think is affected by the other. So when you think response variable, you're thinking which one of the two variables that I'm looking at could be affected by the other. Okay? So it's, the me it's measuring the outcome of the study dependent variable. The second variable is the explanatory variable. This is the one that we think might be having an effect on the other. So when we talk about explanatory variable, we're talking about the variable, so of the two that we happen to be looking at, which one is more likely to cause a change in the other? It's also known as the independent variable. Okay. Now one thing to note here, when we say explanatory, explains or influences changes in the response variable, we have to be careful with how we word this. We are not guaranteed, when we put two variables together, we are not guaranteed to have the two variables that actually have a cause and effect relationship on each other. Okay. Uh, for instance, if we have the two variables, how many TV sets per household a country has, and life expectancy. There's an extremely high positive correlation between the number of TVs per household in a country and their life expectancy. Does that mean we should go into countries and give them all bunches of TVs for their houses to make them live longer? No. 
Okay, so when we're looking at these, we're going to have two variables. Now, they may have something to do with each other. They may not. When we talk about explanatory and response, we look at them and think, okay, of the two, this one probably is going to be the one that causes change. That's going to be my explanatory. This one is probably going to be affected. That's going to be my response. Now, in some cases, you're going to look at the two variables, and there might not be any reason to suspect a cause and effect relationship. And if that's the case, if you don't expect anything to be, like one thing to be causing a difference in the other, you just pick. This one's going to be my explanatory, this one's going to be my response. It won't matter at that point. But if there is some sort of connection that you can see that you think this might do the changing, this might be the one that changes, you need to make sure you label those correctly. So, for example, if I gave you the two variables, the number of hours studied and the score on a test. So the number of hours you study the night before and then the score on the test. Which of these two variables would we expect to be the explanatory? Which one do we think will have an effect on the other? The amount of hours you study and which one should be affected by the other? The score on the test, right? So my explanatory variable here would be the number of hours studied the response variable would be the score on the test. Okay, This one we think is going to be doing the changing, or is going to cause change in the other. This one we think is going to change based on the other. How about the amount of ice cream sold and the outside temperature? So at a local shop, we look at the amount of ice cream sold and the outside temperature. Which one do we expect to cause change? Temperature, which one do we expect to change based on that? The amount of ice cream sold. So explanatory temperature, response, ice cream sold. So again, sometimes there's going to be pretty clear, clear cut depth or difference between the two. This one we think is going to cause a change in the other. Now we can't say it absolutely does cause a change. We'll talk about that later. But they're the ones we would think would have that sort of relationship. And again, if you get two things that you don't think have really any uh, association at all, no relationship, you just simply choose. One's going to be the explanatory, one's going to be the response, it doesn't matter which is which. Okay? And you'll know those when you see them, because it's not going to make sense that they would go together necessarily. Alright, so scatter plots. Scatter plots are a graphical display for two quantitative variables, that's important. Scatter plots can only be created when you are comparing two quantitative variables. So when we were dealing with one data set at a time, we had histograms, we had stem plots, dot plots, bar graphs, pie charts, box plots, and we had all those different graphical displays. When we want to take two quantitative variables and compare them, if we want to see if there's some sort of association, we are going to use a scatter plot to identify that. We're going to use that scatter plot to identify if there's a trend, if there's some sort of relationship that occurs between those two variables. So, this is kind of what your scatter plots are going to look like. You're going to have an X and Y axis, just like any other graphical display. Your X axis is going to be your independent variable. That's going to be your explanatory variable. Think explanatory x-axis. Okay. When you identify your explanatory variable, that automatically means it has to be the x-axis of your graph. When you identify your response variable, that automatically becomes the y-axis in your graph. Okay. And how you plot a scatter plot is by simply taking your ordered pairs and plotting them like you would on any normal XY coordinate plane. So for instance, the example here that you're looking at, this is the, uh, the prediction error for when they've been trying to predict hurricanes. So whenever a hurricane comes, you have all those meteorologists, all those weathermen trying to predict where it's going to go so they can try to get ready for it, so they can try to minimize damage whenever possible, get people out if they need to, things like that. So one of the things that they've always tried to do, since we've had the technology to do it, is try to predict where are these hurricanes going to go. But 
Hurricanes are fairly unpredictable in some cases. They move and they change course on the drop of a hat. So what happens here is they're measuring. Well, how far off our predicted path was that particular hurricane? So how far off or how far do we miss the actual path? Okay, so we have the year. So as we progress through the years from 1970 up to the early 2000s, this is what was happening with our prediction errors, how close we were able to track that particular hurricane. So for instance, in like 1970 here, for one of the hurricanes they measured, they were about 250 miles off its trajected path. Okay, or in 2000, they had a t uh, one that was probably a little under 250 miles off, so maybe about 240 miles away from what the actual path was. So all it is is taking an order pair and plotting it on your xy coordinates. You're going to have a value for x, a value for y that pairs together. You plot them, and you end up with your overall scatter plot. Does that make sense? Okay. And we'll also talk about how to do these in the calculator later on. But for now, when you create a scatter plot, it's going to be by hand. So you're going to create your axes, plot the points manually. Later on, we'll do this in the calculator, and you can just sketch what you see. All right, anytime we get a graphical display, we have to know how to analyze it. We have to know how to describe it, how to pull out the pertinent information and report it to people who might not know what they're looking at. So when we interpret scatter plots, we look at the overall pattern and look for any overall deviations or outliers. So this is exactly the same as what we talked about with our histograms, dot plots, box plots. We look at the overall picture, the big picture, and then we say, okay, are there any values that really fall away from the norm? Are there any deviations? Are there any outliers that we might need to look at and investigate further? So it's overall picture, then we focus in on anything that's weird. Okay? So when we describe a scatter plot, with histograms, we had shape, center, spread. Was it symmetric or skewed? Was it mean or median? was a standard deviation or IQR. Okay, shape, center, spread every time. Now, with scatter plots, we're working with two variables that we're comparing together. We change the terminology a little bit. It's going to be form, direction, strength. So still three items you need to identify, but they're going to be a little bit different in what we're identifying and how we do it. So every time you are asked for a description of a scatter plot, or to describe the association. You have to mention the form, the direction, and the strength. Those three things have to come together. So, what these three things look like. When we talk form, we're talking overall shape. Basically, is it linear? Is it nonlinear? Or is there no pattern whatsoever? Okay, so when we talk about form, there's only three options. Either the association is linear, or it's non-linear, so you might see a curve to it of some sort, or there's really just no pattern at all. There's really nothing you can see as far as a line or a curve or anything that would fit that particular set of data. Okay, so every time you're asked to describe a scatter plot, this is the first thing you mention. Is it a linear association? Is it a nonlinear association? Or is there really no clear picture? There's nothing we can really say about the association itself. Okay, so form is the first one. Direction is pretty straightforward. It's asking, does it go in a positive direction or does it go in a negative direction? So basically, if your x values increase and your pattern increases, so as x goes up, y goes up, that's a positive association. Think about slopes on a graph. If it would have a positive slope, it's a positive association. If it would have a negative slope, it's going to have a negative association. Okay. That also works for non-linear graphs as well. If I had a scatter plot, a 
It looks something like this. As far as the form goes, it's not linear. There's a curve to it. But is it a positive or negative direction? So as x increases, what's happening to y? It decreases. So as x increases, y decreases. This is a negative association. If I were to have a nonlinear scatter plot that ends up increasing, so as x goes up, y goes up, that would be a positive association. So you're always looking at what happens as x increases. Does y go up or does it go down? Does it have a positive slope or a negative slope? Okay, so you're going to have linear, nonlinear, or unclear. Next, you're going to talk about whether it's positive or negative. Now, if you have an unclear, what would you say about positive and negative? Okay. Yeah, if we don't know what shape it is in the first place, if we don't see a pattern to begin with, can we really say whether it's positive or negative? Probably not. There's not going to be much to say there. It's just going to be unclear from there. The last one talks about strength. Now, the strength of a scatter plot, of an association, is how close the points follow the form. So if you see a linear pattern, how closely do the values follow that linear pattern? If it's a nonlinear pattern, how closely do the values follow that nonlinear pattern? Okay. Now, for now, there's no. we're not going to talk about how to quantify this. We're going to have a way to do that tomorrow when we talk about correlation. But for now, we're going to use basically just some words like strength, or they're strong, they're weak, moderately strong, moderately weak, things like that. So if our values follow really closely to our imagined pattern, so here in this first example, there's a linear pattern. Notice the dots are all very close together on that linear pattern. They follow that form really well. That would be a strong association. If you look at the second one, we can see a clear linear pattern to it. But notice the points are much more spread out along that linear pattern. Okay. So what you're thinking to yourself is if we imagine a line cutting through here, okay, how close do the points fall to that particular line? Or in the next one here, if we have a line cut through here, how close are the points to following that line? Right. So in the first one, they're very strong. They're really close to following that exact pattern. In the second one, they're not so good. They scatter out quite a bit more, so that's maybe moderately strong. And as you continue down, you get moderately weak. Or in this last one, you could maybe say there might be a positive association here. But it's really kind of unclear, which means there's kind of a weak association. There's not really anything that we can see that's actually working there. Can you talk about the strength of an unclear form? If it's unclear, it's weak. If, if, the, if you can't see a pattern in it at all, it's a very weak association. That means it's almost it's not existent as far as we can see. So should we take any like should we take the scales on the side into consideration when we determine if it's strong or not, or should it just be like a visual? You're one day ahead of me. For now, go visual. Okay. So for now, just by looking at the graph, because they're not going to try to trick you right now. They're going to just stick with basic stuff. But tomorrow we'll talk about that. Um. So strong. Moderately strong, moderately weak, weak, that's kind of going to be your scale or the values you can use there. Um, and again, this does not just pertain to linear associations. If we have a nonlinear okay, so if we have something like this, this is nonlinear as far as an association goes, but would we call this strong or weak? be very strong. If we look at the pattern, these dots follow that pattern almost exactly, right? So whether it's linear or nonlinear, what you have to decide is if I fit a form to this, fit a curve, fit a line, how closely are those points going to come to following that pattern? Does that make sense? So if they follow it really closely, it's a very strong association. If they're kind of loose, 
more moderately strong, moderately weak. And then again, if there's really no pattern whatsoever, it's weak. There's not really any association there that we can discern. So if it's nonlinear, can there be more than one curve, or is it just one? Um, you mean like can it turn more than once? Yeah. Yeah, I mean a nonlinear can do, like it can turn like this just one time. It could turn all the way around like that. Or yes, it could kind of do this depending on what you're seeing. Okay. Yep. And so if it's not a straight line, we just stick with nonlinear. Otherwise, if there's no clear pattern, we just say unclear and then go from there. Okay. But yes, it can have multiple turns depending on what the data is. Okay with that? Okay, so here I want you to practice. Here's a scatter plot. We're looking at the association between central pressure and max wind speed. I'm guessing maybe like a tornado or a hurricane. Okay, so what I want you to do is describe the scatter plot, describe this association. What form does it have? Linear, nonlinear, or unclear? What direction is it? Positive or negative? And then strength. Strong, moderately strong, moderately weak, or weak? So, Hope, what would you say for the form? Um, I would say it's um, linear. <laughs> okay, so linear. Do you guys agree with that? Mm -hmm. I would too. That looks fairly linear. So my form would be linear. What about direction, Kylie? Um, negative. It's negative. As x increases, y decreases. So there's a negative association. Okay, so definitely negative. And then strength. What would we say for strength, Eli? Pretty strong. Okay. For the most part, pretty strong, right? So if I were to imagine the line passing through, those dots are pretty tightly compacted around it. Now, if we're looking at this, is there anything maybe we would want to maybe investigate further? Any points that seem to kind of fall away from the normal pattern? Yeah, if we look, this one especially looks to be kind of far away from what we normally expect based on our pattern, right? Maybe even the one next to it a little bit. Okay, so if we're looking at these values here, we may want to investigate those. Were those maybe typed down wrong? So did we just record the data incorrectly? Or what was happening that caused those particular values to fall away from the normal pattern? Okay, so when you see things like that, when you see things that might be outliers, things that don't follow the normal trend, you want to try to investigate those further usually. So, with, like, if there's outliers, should we take that into consideration when we're making a best fit line and, like, adapt the line to goals, or should we just... We'll, we'll get there when we get to lines. When we actually start creating the lines, we'll talk about what to do with outliers and how they'll affect it. For now, if all, when we're describing, just be able to identify lines or points that are off the, the normal path. So points that would probably cause a problem when we get to making a line and so on. Yeah. All right, so as far as describing goes, okay, most of the time you're just going to put it into one big statement. Okay, so if you were writing a statement for this particular graph, you would say this association, so the association between central pressure and max wind speed is linear, it's negative, and it's strong. You can do it all in one simple statement. But again, just like with normal distributions, that statement of context has to be there. So the association between central pressure and max wind speed is linear, negative, and strong. We okay with that? All right. Last thing here. Um, this is kind of a scatter plot's real life example. Now, this is not a scatter plot in the sense that we just got done discussing. Scatter plot where we have an x variable, y variable that were quantitative and so on, but it kind of fits into this because he did it using kind of scatter plot mentality. So in World War II, this statistician Abraham Wall developed a method <coughs> to help aid in the war effort. 
And how he did that was he analyzed planes that were returning back from battle. So all the planes that were coming back, he would grab them and he would start examining them. And what he did was he took a, a layout and he'd start marking in where were they being damaged. So all these airplanes coming back, he's analyzing yeah, all of them and saying, okay, here's where all the damage is happening. Okay, so all these red dots correspond to damage taken on a particular plane. Now what he did there was he took this information and said to the military, hey, based on this, I have the perfect spot for you to start putting more armor. Because armor weighs a lot. The more you put on it, the less likely the plane is to fly or the more fuel you're going to burn, which means they can't fly as far on a given flight. So he was trying to increase the protection by also minimizing the overall weight. He's saying, okay, let's take some armor away from some spots and let's start refortifying others. Where do you guys suppose he told them to put the new armor? The tail, the wings? So specifically where? On the front end? Okay. This is what he told them. Put more armor here. He said, take armor away from spots like this and like this. Take some of that weight off and refortify these areas here. Why? Because the flights, the airplanes that took the damage he was looking at came back. So that must mean the flights that were not returning were taking damage in these locations here. So he said, if we want more planes to come back, <laughs> we need to make these pieces stronger, and we don't need as much here. They're taking the damage and still making it fine, right? So that was a way that he used kind of a scatterplot mentality to aid in that effort. So they were able to actually fortify those planes better, start bringing more back. Does that make sense? All right. <laughs> So oh, here's your assignment. So for the most part, just going to be identifying explanatory response variables, creating a scatter plot or two, describing scatter plots. So talking about form, direction, strength, all of that. So you got lots of time here. I want you to use that to start working through these problems. So if you need to borrow a book, you can borrow a book. Or if you wanted to pull it up on your phone, whatever, you can do that. If you want to work with a partner, you can. But make sure you're utilizing this time.